And a good morning to you. So good to see you today. Take your hymn book, if you would, on this Valentine's Day weekend. Let's begin with the first day of the week, recognizing the greatest Valentine, the Lord Jesus, and the power of his love to lift us. I hope you know that. Stand, if you would. Hymn number 508. Lift your voice now. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me When nothing else could help Love lifted me, love lifted me Love lifted me When nothing else could help Love lifted me all my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by His love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows His will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. Wonderful singing. Pray with me if you would, please. Heavenly Father God, what a joy it is to know the lifting of the love of God. Lord, many of us in this room, we understand that that was us sinking deep in sin. We were far from a peaceful shore. Be truthful about it. We had no hope within until one day we heard about God's great love. We read it and it went like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, many of us have received Jesus as our savior. We know the everlasting life that he is and we know the lifting and now our feet are set on higher ground. God, I pray that you'd minister to us today, protect and keep us. Lord, I pray that we would know the true joy of worshiping you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Turn around, shake hands. Welcome someone today. And as you come back to your place, remain standing, lift your eyes to the screen. 
What a joy it is to know his love that has lifted us. Now let's lift his name upon high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lift your voice, God's people, and let us give him glory to his name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord you lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praises i'm so glad you're in my life i'm so glad you came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on a high amen you may be seated wonderful singing as we Lift high the name of the Lord Jesus. So good to see you on this second Sunday of the month of February. And this Lord's Day ushers in a great week this week. And we're excited to be able to celebrate that as we celebrate love and relationships. Good thing it's only one day a year. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that, and uh, what a joy. If you're visiting with us today, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to have you. In the pew in front of you is a connection card. If you'd be so kind as to reach out, grab that connection card, fill it out, put it in the offering plate when it goes by. That'll give us a record of your attendance. Speaking of connection cards, after the service today, we have our connection luncheon. Many of you that are visiting with us or been visiting the last couple of weeks or months, you've been contacted. The luncheon is going to be on the west side of the building, rooms 103 and 104. And we would love to have you, uh, especially if you told us you were coming. We're looking forward to you being there. This is an opportunity for me to take a moment and meet you face to face, for you to meet the staff, get to know you a little bit. And we're excited about that. And so... I, I pray that you would move there quickly after the service and uh, spend some time together. It's a busy day here today, a very, 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 very busy day, uh, especially with our pictorial directory. Many of you, I think we got over 100 families that are supposed to get their picture taken after the service today. And we had 100 plus last week. I think we got another 100 plus lined up next week. So if you are scheduled to get your picture taken today, you're in the first room after the service off the lobby on the east side. You go in there, they got a paper for you to fill out, and then we're going to take your mug shot and put you in our book. If you call Plantation Baptist your church, whether you're a member or not, but you call us your church, we want your picture. You tell people in the community, I go to that church in Plantation, or I'm part of that then we would love to have your picture. Pastor, we haven't registered for that. That's okay. Today may not be the day to sneak in, but you could at least stop by the welcome desk and get yourself organized for the next time, uh, I think on the 24th of the month. But we're trying to put together a pictorial directory and we want everybody that we can possibly get. Tonight is our evening service and at six o'clock, we are delighted to have with us our missionary family to Mongolia. Anybody ever been to Mongolia? You've ever been there? Not allowed to raise your hand, Brother Kuchko. Uh, Jeff and Kim and Cece, stand if you would. These are our missionaries to Mongolia. This is not Santa Claus. This is Brother Jeff here. And I want Manku, Manku, stand if you would, please. 
Manku is, is a Mongolian native, powerful and wonderful testimony, knows the Lord, grew up in the orphanages of Mongolia, studying to be a lawyer, helping in the ministry over there. You will not believe the exciting things that God is doing in the country of Mongolia. Our missionary is going to give a report tonight. You can be seated. Welcome them, by the way. Let's welcome them. You will not believe. You will not believe what God is doing through this ministry to parts of the world that I'm not allowed to say publicly. But if you come tonight, you'll be able to hear and it will blow your mind what the Lord is doing. So I look forward to that. By the way, if your kids are in our Sunday night choir, they're singing tonight. They need to be here at 515. Not only is today busy, the week is busy. Uh, on Wednesday, we have our normal services um, be prior to that, we have a special spaghetti fundraiser meal for our Christian school. The senior class is headed to Boston for a senior trip, and they have that has been lined up by Brother Bergman. It's a wonderful historical educational trip. At least that's what they tell me. We'll see what happens when they get there. Um, but they're going to do a fundraiser meal for that. So we normally do a meal on, on Wednesday night. Come ready to give. I know what you're thinking. Pastor, senior boys and spaghetti just doesn't sound very appealing. I think their mothers are helping, so at least you'll be able to swallow whatever they put down in front of you there. The Collingsworth family, next Sunday night. Man, it's going to be awesome. Get your ticket today. It's $10. Um, you need this service. Whether you, you like the style of music or not, you need to just enjoy being bathed in some good gospel music about our Lord, about the blood, about the cross, about the Savior. And uh, we're partnering with a couple of sister churches now. And I think even Pastor Jay is going to be here that night. Brother Pastor Allie is going to be here that night. They're, some of their people are coming. And um, it's going to be great. Get your ticket today. Uh, the place is filling up. We have a cap on that. We're not there yet, but there, there's room for you, but not much longer And as we make our way past Wednesday. All right, if you believe and love the name of Jesus, would you say amen? amen. The choir is going to sing a song. It's an oldie. It's a little bit of a twangy. They do it perfectly. You're going to go home with this thought in your mind. What a lovely name. God bless you, choir, as you lift your voice.
Thank you, choir. What a lovely name indeed. In your hymn book, Once in a While, like hymns 78 and 79, the organizer of the hymn book will take two hymns and link them together. They're linked together by melody. They're linked together by message. And as we sing the hymn, we're able to easily transition uh, to the next one. Such would be the case with I love you, Lord, and my Jesus, I love thee. I love you, Lord, is a chorus where I lift my voice to worship, where I reckon the rejoicing of my soul that Jesus is king, and I want him to be pleased with the sweet, sweet sound of my worship in his ear. And uh, hymn 79 are the reasons that I love him. I love thee because. Oh, there's all kinds of reasons there. Church family, if you love the Lord, say amen. amen. We have people that are visiting with us or gathering with us today. They don't know our Lord. They, they're hurt, they're broken, they have a need. For whatever reason, they've come today to be with us. I want them to hear by the way we sing how great our God is. So I want you to stand and I want you to lift your voice and rejoice. And I want you to sing the reasons that we love our great Lord. 78 and 79, God bless you. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign my gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now, I love thee. Because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary Street. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If Jesus, tis now. I love thee in life. I will love thee in death. And praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath. And say, Dead do lie cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the 
glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. You're singing outstanding today. Man, if you'll wait on us for our offering. I have two announcements to share with you. It seems very often that I'm coming to the platform letting you know that some of our faithful brothers and sisters have gone on to be with the Lord. Yesterday, we had the memorial service for Fran Leo. Friday night, our precious dear sister, Blossom James, went home to be with the Lord. Many of you may not have known Blossom. She was, when I came to be the pastor, just a tremendous, vibrant member. She's been a shut-in over the last few years, and um, Friday night, absent from the body, present with the Lord. She is with the Lord today. I was thinking about her as we were singing that hymn. Just got a phone call from Doris Lewis. You remember Doris Lewis? Bill is in the hospital. It's 97, 98 years old, and she's not heard yet. I don't know how serious or not, but we need to pray for Brother Lewis today as well. Maybe, maybe the greatest Christian that I know is Bill Lewis. That guy loves God with all his heart, mind, and soul. And, um, So we need to lift them in prayer. Pray with me if you would, please. Heavenly Father, God, man, it did my heart well just to stand down there and sing, I love thee because. I was thinking about most of the world. They don't know you for who you are. They've let other people dictate, circumstances dictate or define They've let their own mind kind of define who you are. They've never known you through the word of God. They've never known you through a personal relationship. And they're a little timid and they're a little distant. And they just don't know what the believer knows. Those of us that are inhabited by God. Those of us that have believed upon Jesus. For we know him to be great. And we know him to be loving and kind and merciful We know him to have paid for our sin, dying on the cross, buried, and rising again to justify us. And we've got reason to sing because. I thank you for that wonderful privilege to know you and to love you. I trust from your people today that our worship has been a sweet, sweet sound into your ear. I pray, Father, for the rest of the service now that you would enable me to preach, enable hearts and ears to listen. And everyone that's come to the room, God, you've got a word for today. And so I pray as individuals, we would hear, thus saith the Lord. Thank you for receiving Blossom. She, she knew you. She had eternal life. And you've transitioned her from this body of pain to the glorious presence of Jesus Christ. All her physical body is here, but Blossom is with the Lord. And we rejoice in that. Thank you, God. Our brother Bill is in the hospital as our other folks today ministers, the great physician, I pray, and do what only you can do. Thank you, God, for the wonderful privilege to gather today. Bless our service now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. May be seated as we continue our time of worship. Listen as Brother Jeff and Brother Juan refresh us in the love of our Lord and our love for him.
Thank you, gentlemen. Power, powerful. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and find, if you would, first off in the New Testament, the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke would be the first text that I would love for you to find, the sixth chapter of the book of Luke. If you do not have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the pew in front of you or look on with a neighbor. Maybe a neighbor has two or three in their family. They would hand you one once they find that. Also, if you would, please, in the Old Testament, there's a little tiny book. It's in the minor prophet section, but it has a major part of the service today. Find the book of Micah, M-I-C-A-H, Micah. Pastor, I have no idea where Micah is. Then find in your beginning of your Bible, the glossary, look in the Old Testament section, find the page number, and you'll find the book of Micah. You won't need the book of Micah till the end of the message. So if it takes you that long to find it, you're in, you're in good shape. Luke chapter number six. Right at the beginning, I need to share something with you that I, I believe you will need to remember throughout this message. The first thing I would like to share with you as your pastor is I did not intend on preaching this message today. I had two other messages that I tried very hard to preach today. Um, I have them prepared. I am ready for them. In my plan, I was looking forward to that. God, very quickly within my preparation and prayer time, let me know that he didn't want me to preach either of those two messages. I can be honest with you and say, I didn't like that, but I trust him. How do you know, pastor, when God lets you preach one message or not, or a different message? Usually it happens within my preparation as I go to a passage or I go to a thought When the Lord is in that message, it's interesting if you've ever prepared a message before, as you look at the scripture, almost the outline just pops in your mind and the thought process is logical and the application just unfolds and and you can feel it in your heart and your mind and your spirit building upon precept upon precept. When the Lord is not in a message at that moment in time, it's like running into a wall for me. Uh, I, nothing comes together. I can't seem to get a uh, concentration in what I'm reading. So that happened with message number one. I figured, great, then he must want message number two. So I pulled that message number two out at the kitchen table. Same thing happened. I thought, I don't have any more messages. <laughs> so now I know the Lord's trying to get my attention. So I get up from the Table And when I, when I think hard, I have to walk. Is there anybody else like me? You have to walk when you think hard. So, so I got up from the table. I started walking around the house, walking outside. And I'm like, Lord, okay, obviously you don't want either one of these. What do you want? And in my spirit, I felt him say, go back to your Bible reading that you did this week. And let me show you something. And so I came back to my Bible reading. And God showed me what he wanted for today. And before I read it to you, here's what I want to tell you. God is after somebody today. I don't know who you are. But I know God is after you. He may be after multiple people. I do believe within the message, there is instruction and help and blessing for all of us. The best word I can say, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a crude, crass word, is that, that God is targeting somebody today. Here's what I want to say to you, because in a moment, it's going to become clear to you what God is doing. Anytime God comes after somebody, it's always for our better. When I preach you this message, I'm... I believe the truth today can set you free from the prison that you find yourself in in your mind and the prison you find yourself in in your conscience and the prison you find yourself in in your being. When God says to you, I'm speaking to you, 
relax, listen, and say to God, what do you want me to do, God? I have found whenever I say, what do you want me to do, God? He shows me. And whatever God wants me to do, it's usually for two reasons. For my good and for his glory. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Let me show you what God gave me. Go to, if you would, to verse number 20. And he, Luke chapter 6, verse 20, that he is Jesus, lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, the rest of the chapter you will find is the Lord Jesus quoted verbatim by Luke. Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company, shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Good night, Pastor. I'm not sure I want to be one of his disciples with all of that. Verse 23 begins with what word, class? Wow. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Are you kidding me? For behold, your reward is great in where? Heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets, but woe unto you that are rich. Now, if you're rich in this room, we're glad to have you. Just kidding about that. It's not talking about material riches here. What he's saying is, don't let material riches keep you from becoming poor in spirit so that you don't receive the Lord. But woe unto you that are rich, for you have your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall Hunger. These were people that didn't want the Lord. They didn't want righteousness. Woe unto you that laugh now. Boy, the world sure laughs at the believer today, don't they? For you will mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear. And would you say those three words out loud with me? Love your enemies. On this Sunday before Valentine's Day, God wants me to preach a message that I have entitled a biblical Valentine's Day. And God wants me to preach to you today about loving your enemies. Would you continue reading with me today? Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. Of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. You ought to have that verse underlined in your Bible. That's one of the great verses of the Bible. For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. If you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. If you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good. And lend, hoping for nothing again. And your 
reward shall be what class? Great. Great. You shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye, and this is our last one, therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. On this Sunday before Valentine's Day, God has laid on my heart a message for our church today on the subject of loving your enemies. I wrote down some things, some questions I would like to answer right at the beginning. The first question that may be coming from your mind is, Pastor, are you trying to ruin my Valentine's Day? The answer to that would be, no, I'm not trying to ruin your Valentine's Day. I'm trying to deepen your walk with the Lord. I'm trying to preach a message to you today that I really do believe will impact not only your life, but it will impact and could impact our world in a massive, massive way. Jesus is preaching a message here today that is to his disciple. It's very important that you understand who he's speaking to. The disciple was one who was a follower of Jesus. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, first off, you have to be born again by the Lord Jesus. So he's speaking to people who have believed that Jesus is the Messiah. They have opened their heart to him. They have received him. And he's preaching to them about them and about his way and his work in their life. And he's explaining to them that, that as a follower of Jesus, their practice is going to be extremely counter to the culture. And he has done this in the book of Matthew as well, where he has exalted the culture and lifted it and how they practice. And and, and now he is contrasting that with how a child of the living God is to live his life. And, And Jesus is letting them know that in the world, there are some things that sinners understand. He touched on that in verses 32, 33, and 34. And he talks about the fact that even sinners understand that it's easy to love them that love you. That's normal. That's natural. It's easy to like somebody who likes you. It's easy to relate to somebody who relates to you. In verse number 33, he says, it's easy to do good to people who like you. It's easy to be kind to them. Even sinners do the same. In verse number 34, he, he, he's talking to them about a business practice here. And he says, even the world understands lending and they lend money so that they can get interest and so that they can make money. And there, there's a way that the culture operates. And this culture that he was talking about was a culture that was a pharisaical culture, a culture that was religious in practice, but they did not have a relationship with Jesus. I want to say just a moment right here. Religious people is not what God is after. God is after people who he can have a relationship with. Oh, if we could get this into the mind of our friends and our family and the world. All religion does is it distance God and it makes me feel like somehow I've got to merit myself to God or or please God or do something that would get his attention. Therefore, God will give me his favor. My friend, God doesn't give you his favor based on your merit. God gives us favor based on his love and his grace. And and it's not religion that God wants. He wants a personal relationship with you through his son. And so Jesus has got this multitude here and he takes his 12 disciples and he says, you know me, you have a relationship with me. You have believed upon me. And so therefore uh, that life that I have brought you is so counter to the culture of the day. And that life that he brought to us is one that as people look at our lives, they ought to be able to see that we're different. They ought to see the work of the Holy Spirit. They ought to see the salvation of the Lord Jesus in our lives. And our light is to so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And Jesus said this, 
One of the ways that that is done is how you love. How you love. Are you here today and you have an enemy? You can see them. You know their name. You're, 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 you're there in your mind. And by the way, right now, I'm talking to saved people. Unsaved people have enemies too. But I'm talking to the church people. You have an enemy. I want to say a couple of things right at the beginning of my message that you need to know. What I'm getting ready to preach you about loving your enemy, Christian, does not mean that you love Satan as our great enemy. Satan is the arch enemy of God. He hates everything about God, and one day he's going to get his just due. I want to say this, too, to everybody in the room. Don't listen to this message and let, God, and let Satan tell you that God is your enemy. God is no man's enemy. Sometimes circumstances happen. Sometimes things happen in our lives and Satan says, God, and he could have done this, he could have done this, and God said, no, 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 my friend. God loved me when I was at enmity with him. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, down here. The greatest lie Satan gives to people to keep them from knowing how great God is is he tells them he's your enemy. Last time I know, no enemy of mine ever died for me. He died for the world. You have an enemy? Pastor, what, what are we talking about here? Let me just give you some words that define this word enemy. We're talking about a hostile. We're talking about somebody that has hostility toward you. They are an aggressive adversary. They are your foe. Uh, one commentator put it this way. They detest you. You think about that. Not only do they detest you, they pursue you with hatred. That's a pretty aggressive person. They revile you. They reproach you. They disparage you. They misuse you. They slander you. And if they could, they would do you physical harm. About that person, God says for you, Christian, to love them. Pastor, to love them? How can God ask me to love them? Doesn't God know what they've done to me? Doesn't God know how they hurt me? Doesn't God know what they're doing right now? And you're telling me that that, that person that detests me, that pursues me, that person that is hostile to me, you're telling me that God tells me to love them? How can God ask that? Well, the reason that God can ask that is because God has loved his enemies. And love is of God, and God is love, and God has proven that love to us. Jesus is not asking his disciples to do anything that Jesus has not already done. Fascinating. I would say this. If Jesus is telling me to love somebody at that extreme, then I would think Jesus would want me to love my coworker who simply offended me. Or my family member who has hurt me. Or somebody that has mistreated me. I mean, Jesus is to the point where the person that detests me and pursues me, he wants me to love. That's got to fit everyone else who I would have be, see in an adversarial position here. By the way, just so we're clear about what he wants us to do, would you look at verse number 28? Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. What he's asking them to do there is to invoke a blessing upon them for happiness. Pray for their happiness implore God's blessing in God's 
favor upon them. But you're not allowed to hate them. Christian, please tell me there's something you don't hate people. God hates sin. But he doesn't hate people. If you're not careful as believers, we can allow Satan to work within our hearts bitterness and hatred toward others that will only destroy us. How can God ask me to love my enemy? He didn't ask you, he told you to do it. Pastor, I think I love them. I mean, I don't, I don't, really, I don't really hold animosity in my heart toward them. You know, they, we all like to think this. Well, they are, they're my enemy. They have wronged me. They have done this. I haven't done anything to them, but I just, I just don't hold animosity in my heart. That might make you feel better, Christian, but that's not God's word. Go back to the verse and let me show you something. Come to verse 27. But I say unto you, which hear, What is the very next word, class? Love your enemies. What is the very next word, class? Do. Do? Do good. Biblical love is an action. Well, Pastor, I don't hold animosity toward them, fine, but that's not the extent of what God wants you to do to your enemy. God wants you to actively love your enemy. Do something to them, not choke the life out of them. And when you make an action toward them, it's a righteous do. We all think, well, I don't have any, you know, they've, they've done horribly to me, but I don't hold animosity in my heart. Fine. But what action have you shown upon them to show them the love of God? When you read the Bible, and you ought to take a Strong's Concordance, and you ought to look up the word enemy or enemies and study that. It's fascinating. You will find that the Bible speaks a lot about what you should do to your enemy. Well, Pastor, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even know where to begin to do good unto them. I was hoping you would think that. Look at verse number 31, please. And as ye would that men should do to, to you, Do ye also to them, what class? So you have an enemy. They detest you. They hate you. They pursue you. They're out to destroy you. They're your enemy. You know it. They know it. Everybody knows it. And Jesus says to you as a believer, love your enemy. Do good to them. Well, I've done a little bit of good to them. No, no, no. The base thought of that is this. Think in your mind what you would want them to do for you, how you would want them to treat you, and then you do that to them. By the way, without their request, Pastor, you mean I need to think how, how what I would want them to do for me in the office, what I would want them to do for me out in the field, what I would want them to do for me in the relationship here. You're, you're, you're telling me that love is active. I understand that. The action that I'm to do to my enemy as a child of God is I am to do good to them. And the base is this. I'm to treat them the way that they, I want them to treat me, and I'm to do it first? 
I, I, I don't think I can. That's interesting. The Bible says, I can do all things through. It strengtheneth me. Pastor, help me. Let me give you a truth, Christian, that please don't forget this. I think most Christians forget this truth. The next two truths are worth the price of your admission today. Go to verse 35. Love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again. And your, what's that class, verse class? Your reward shall be what? Great. Come back to verse number 23. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great. Where, class? Okay. It amazes me how many Christian people live in a prison of enmity. You let one person dominate your life. Whether it's something that happened years ago as an enmity act or something that is currently acting. You think about it, you meditate on it, you dwell on it, you let it drive you, it imprisons you. You know what I have found about that? Is usually the enemy doesn't think twice about you during the day. I've had people mistreat me, and I get just in the flesh that you do, and then I go on social media, and they're at Disney World having a great time. And I'm, I'm in my house pouting like a little sissy, thinking the whole world, I'm praying, God, I'm done, I quit, I'm going somewhere, this is over, this is, I can't take it anymore. And I turn on whatever, on a social media, and I see the person that offended me, and they're going, yay, Mickey's world. I'm thinking, why am I sitting in my house moping? Why would I let one person dominate me like that? We live in a prison, but we don't have biblical understanding. So the biblical understanding is one day you're going to stand before God. Everybody in the room is going to stand before God. So as a Christian, I'm going to stand before God at something called the great or at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. I will never have to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. Oh, by the way, you don't want to be there. You want to have Jesus in your heart. You want to be redeemed. You do not want to meet God at the great white throne judgment because that's where your sin will be announced and that's where you will be dismissed from his presence for all eternity. I should be there, but I have received him as my Lord and Savior. If you've done that, say amen. amen. But I will stand before God as a believer and I've got to give an account for my life. What does that mean? That means that every work that I have ever done in my life, whether it be good or bad, is going to be exposed in heaven. The Bible talks about it being tried by fire to find out what sort of work it is. Was it an earthly work that was filled with my own desires or was it a heavenly work that was done by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God? And those works that were done selfishly are going to be consumed in that fire and there will be no reward for that. But the works that have been done for the glory of God and honest of heart and intent, when they go through the fire, they're going to be uh, purified and I'm going to be rewarded for that. Most Christian people, we don't, we don't think that way. We, we don't think that we will care about being rewarded in heaven as long as we're there. So foolish is that. When you're standing before the one who died for you, the last thing you want is for your life to go up in smoke. And those that are living in the prison of an enemy and every motive you have is against them. You don't understand. When your life's work goes through that, whoosh. Why would you do that? 
Why would you let somebody put you in prison here? And why would you let somebody steal your reward up there? You know what I found? It's a lot easier to love than to hate when it's done with the power of God. Pastor, I just, and here I need God's help. Lord, you got to help me. I pastor a lot of people here. Pastor, I just need them to get what's due. If you've ever prayed that, put your hand in your pocket. Okay. We live in a world today that is crying out for justice. And we live in a world that is crying out against injustice, social injustice. Everywhere you look in our country and in the world, humanity is wanting justice. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is all humanity are sinful people. We're all sinful people. And we all have an opinion, and we all have a direction, and we all think we know what is best. Ultimately, we all think we know what justice is or is not. The problem with that is the only one that knows true justice is the living God, and it's presented to us in his living word. So God's people struggle with justice or injustice. Is God for injustice? God hates injustice. Is God for justice? Absolutely. He's a just God. Would you hold your hand here and go to Micah 6, please? You need this for your, for your, your theology. Are you there? All right. I got your attention. Good. Verse number eight. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do Say the word. And to love mercy. Do, Micah 6, 8, to do justly. But to love mercy. He didn't tell you to figure out what justice is. He told God's people to do justice. We find what is just in the word of God. You and I as Christian people are to live just lives. Amen. Amen. But we're to love mercy. Why? Because people are sinners. He's preaching a message that's counterculture. The culture is saying we want justice. And Jesus says love mercy. Because honestly, if I got what was just to me, I'd be in hell forever. And we have, we have God's people that have let enemies and enmity and the thought of justice just be ringing in our brain and we're just waiting for justice. But we don't know what God is doing. We don't know every situation. We don't have the mind of God. We think we know. We have the word of God to direct us. But God said, you're to do justly. You're to reckon justice. And there ought to be justice. And God is for justice. But you ought to love mercy. And when you come back to the book of Luke, he said, be merciful for your father is merciful. You want to change our world? Let God's people start loving their enemies. Let God's people start loving mercy. Let me go to my neighbor 
and love my neighbor like Christ loved me. Let me bring to my neighbor the gospel of Jesus Christ, the person of Christ. Let my neighbor's heart be brought into justness with God and he'll do justly. And by one, by one, by one, by one, we could change the world. But something happened to the church and we're lopsided. We're all about justice and we forgot to love mercy. And Jesus said, love the guy that detests you. Love the guy that hates your guts. Love the guy that is disparaging you. Love him. Think what you would want him to do to you. Treat him that way. Do it. Be merciful. By the way, when you get to heaven, your reward will be great. Pastor, I want my reward now. Okay. Just let me let the Bible read to you what it said. <clears throat> Verse number 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now. You're going to mourn and you're going to weep. What is he saying? Don't sacrifice now the blessing and the reward that awaits for you later. You leave justice up to God. You love mercy. You love people. You love your enemy. You let the love of God shine through you. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. I know. Pastor, I don't have the ability to do this. Yeah, you do through the Lord Jesus, you do. Pastor, what if I don't want to? Pastor, where do you get all your questions from? (laughs) Okay. Christian, look me in my eyeball. If you don't want to, your problem's not with your enemy. Your problem's with your God. Because your God forgave you when you were his enemy. He wants you to love your enemy. Even the world is going to celebrate Valentine's Day on Wednesday. I've been to Walmart. They're all there buying the chocolate. (laughs) Let us celebrate the love of God every day. You have an enemy? Go love them. Amen? Amen? Let's be done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, So counter to the culture was the Lord Jesus. So counter is the word of God. The culture back then was all about justice. And God God is for justice and he hates injustice. And there is injustice in this world and God is going to deal with that. But the disciple of the Lord is to love mercy. He's to do justly. He's to love mercy. He's to be merciful. And we're to love our enemy. I wonder with heads bowed and eyes closed. In the beginning of the message, I said this to you. God was after somebody. I don't know who that person was or is or peoples are. But was it you I told you in the beginning that the message was not designed to further your imprisonment or enrage you. It was to set you free. It was to bring you into a position of mercy, to know the blessing of God, to set you free from the prison of enmity, the heaviness of burden, to 
follow the Lord, Christian. Man, our world would be different if God's people were merciful and we loved our enemies. God speak to you. Pastor, I have an enemy. They're everything you describe them to be. God has spoken to me about how I'm relating to them. Don't embarrass me. Don't call my name. But pray for me, God. Pastor, I need prayer in this area. If you raise your hand, I'd pray for you. Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to me today. God spoke to me. Hands everywhere. God bless you. You can put them down. God bless you. Pastor, I came in today thinking that maybe God was my enemy. No, my friend, God's not your enemy. God loves you. He died for you. He wants to save you and redeem you. He wants to change your life. Pastor, I've been through a lot in my life. We all have. Man, I could tell you how I've hurt. And I could tell you what I've been through. God has loved me. And to know him and to know his word is the greatest thing of my life. Pastor, I need to know God. I want to know him as my savior. Don't embarrass me. Don't call my name. Well, right where I sit, I just want you to know that I'd like to become a Christian today. I'd like to give my heart to the Lord. If that's you and you just lift your hand, I'd say, God bless you and pray for you. Is there anybody say, Pastor, I'd like to receive the Lord today in the balcony on the main floor? Anybody? Okay. Heavenly Father, God, the people have listened. The stillness of the room is your presence. We're all thinking, my loving, my enemy. Some people may not have an enemy right now, but they need this message in a little bit. Help us to remember it. But I pray this Valentine's Day that my life would shine bright for the Lord and that the way that I love would draw people to Christ. Help us, God. Many raise their hand, meet them in their need, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song of invitation, if you would stand, please, is 596. Men of God are here. Ladies are here to pray with. Maybe you want to come today and do business with the Lord. God spoke to your heart. Maybe you want to come today and present yourself for membership or baptism or be saved. You come, see one of the men in the aisle, and we will help you. If God is speaking to you, he's speaking to you for your good and his glory. I pray that you would respond to that. Lift your voice, men, you come. 596, verse number one. I'm going to be dominated by anybody. I want to be dominated by the Lord. Before we sing our final verse, if you have an enemy that you're letting dominate you and consume you and create anger and bitterness in you, and you know the Lord, you don't have to live like that. I'm telling you right now, the Lord Jesus can give you victory and freedom there. He's after you today. Pastor, just... I just can't let it go. Well, 
then let God take it from you. But let God do something. My final statement. Hate will destroy you. It will destroy you. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your children. It will stay in your family into the grandchildren. And unless it's rooted out of there, it will do nothing but destroy. One more verse while I get the record here. Verse number three. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thy. May Thy Holy Spirit fill me, may I know Thy power divine. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Thank you so much for being here today. Our song to go home is page 602, hymn 602. We have coming forward today, Irving Santiago. Irving was baptized last week. He became a member of our church based on his baptism but he loves you. He didn't get to shake your hand or you shake his hand. So he's come forward today to re uh, rejoice in his membership. He'll be down front, come by, shake his hand, welcoming into Plantation Baptist Church. If you're getting your picture taken, you're in the front over there. And if you're having lunch, you're over here in this room. The rest of you are on your own. Lift your voice now. 602. See you tonight at six o'clock. God bless you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus.